So now that everybody's thoroughly caffeinated and sugared, um, we're going to continue on with our program with uh, Adam Bergasser, who got his bachelor's degree from University of California, San Diego, and then uh, went down the coast to Caltech to get his um, master's and PhD uh, in physics with a minor in planetary science, then spent his postdoc years as uh, first a Hubble Fellow, then a Spitzer Fellow, Hubble Fellow at UCLA, and a Spitzer Fellow at uh, American Museum of Natural History. Then he was faculty at MIT for a while and has since uh, come on back home to UCSD. Uh, so without further ado, Adam Bergesser. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, wow, if I can get that response just for my introduction. It should be a great talk. Um, so how is everyone's brains? Full yet? Yeah. What? <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna put a little bit more in your brains. We're gonna go a little bit off, uh, maybe off on a tangent here, because this is, these are gonna be objects, I'm gonna talk about brown dwarfs. These are objects that are uh, debatably somewhere between star planets and stars, and we still argue about where that middle road is, but I'll try to convince you uh, that in fact we cons consider them both, and we can look at them both, and in many ways they provide some of our best constraints of looking at the atmospheres of the kind of planets that we're now finding uh, through Kepler, through uh, all these other uh, different um, uh, satellites. Um, I wanted to start though a little bit back and take us up into the sky. Uh, this is a free program if you're ever interested in, in having a nice sort of Stellarium that you show in class. It's actually called Stellarium. You can download it offline. It's totally free uh, and it's very useful. And this is actually what uh, it's what Santa Barbara looking to the west is going to look like in about four hours. All right, and uh, so we've got the setting sun, and we've got these two nice bright uh, little stars here, which turn out not to be stars. They're actually Venus and Mercury. Uh, you can't see Juno up there. And uh, of course, as we uh, if we start uh, time moving a little bit faster, uh, we'll get the sun setting. They'll become very very bright stars in the sky. And they're moving, right? They're moving across the sky. And of course, as we let, we let things go by, it gets darker, some more stars come by. We'll let this go a little bit faster, just so it goes by. And everything is moving. Okay, so any, you know, any one of us 10,000 years ago would have seen this up in the sky, would have seen the stars and the planets swinging by uh, on their daily cycle. All right, let's go back. Ooh, too far. Whoa. I'm a little trigger happy here, I guess. Okay, it's the coffee. Okay, so uh, so that's what it's going to look like at about 20 to 8. So I, you know, I encourage you to go out and look in the sky at that time. Now, with a solarium, we can actually do something really fun, and we can turn off the atmosphere, and we can turn off the ground, and we can see what it looked like in space. Is there any way to reduce the lights a little bit more in here? Probably not with the sun. <laughs> All right, that's actually, that's great. That's fine. I took the earth away. I'm that powerful. Um, so now if you were watching on a daily cycle, you would see these stars moving across the sky. You would see these other bright things moving across the sky. And if you were a careful observer, and as humans had more time to look at the sky and keep track of things and actually write things down, they would notice that if they looked at the same time of night every night, I have to remember which key this is, uh, if they went back the next night, oops, they would find that the stars are in the same position, but those planets have moved relative to the stars. So I'm stepping through by one sidereal day, which is essentially the time it takes for the stars to go right back to the same position in the sky. And if you're a careful observer and you did this every night, you would notice that a few things in the sky change position, all right, including the sun. And here comes Jupiter. So daily we see the stars moving across the sky. Multiple days, months, weeks, years, we would see other things moving across the sky. Let's go back and see where Jupiter is. There he is. Okay? And you could track these patterns over years, and you would find that there are sort of we can divide the whole universe into two kinds of objects: things that move and things that don't. All right? Stellar things which stay put. Oh, this is a great time. Remember this date, April 24th, 2011. Everything lined up. Here's the problem, of course. It's in the middle of the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, we'll go on with that. All right, so, so the, the pointer is that for, for thousands of years, thousands of years, we have been able to divide our universe up into sort of two... Oh, now I can't get to my other thing. We've been able to divide our universe up into sort of two classes of objects. Planets, which move across the sky, and stars that don't. And so there's this cultural distinction that we have between these two types of objects. And there's a problem with my presentation. There we go. Okay. So there's a cultural distinction between these two types of objects. If you sit and you get you know, a bunch of guys together in underwear and watch the sky for a while, uh, you would find that you could break up everything in the sky by these two classes. So for thousands of years, we've done this. And now, as we've gotten more smart in our physics and, and been able to sort of actually figure out what's actually going on with these stars, what makes them work, we've still been able to divide those objects into two different classes uh, in many ways. So if we look at a star like the sun, we know, of course, that it emits all of this light across its entire surface. Right? And that light is ultimately coming from fusion energy in its core. It's an energy producer. In fact, it produces all the energy uh, that we really use here on Earth uh, at some level. So, so that's one part of the physics of this object. And of course, planets, at least in the optical, the light that we see is light that's reflected back at us from the sun. So again, at least at optical wavelengths, we don't see them generating that light. They're reflecting the light back. Again, a very clear distinction between those two objects. Um, if we look at them in the sky, we find that stars are really found all over the place. They're found as isolated objects, as their own individual systems. Our sun at some level is an individual star, its own individual system, and there are many, many stars that are like that. Whereas when we look for planets, and now that we're actually able to detect planets in other, uh, other solar systems, so this is a picture of the HR uh, uh, 8799 system, which was just uh, resolved about a year ago. All right, it's not a plaid star. This is just the artifact of subtracting out the extremely bright light uh, from that star to reveal these very faint planets. But again, we see these planets as orbiting around other stars. And a lot of our planet detection methods is based on that assumption that planets are things that we find in orbits around other stars. So you can go on with that assumption as long as you want. But of course, if you're a very skeptical type of scientist, you might ask, well, are there stars that don't generate enough light uh, to fuse, don't, don't have enough energy to fuse hydrogen and don't generate that really bright optical light that we free, see from the sun? And are there planets that are actually in orbit around other stars? All right, how far can we really push those definitions? And so based on the title of the talk, the answer is, of course, yes. And they are brown dwarfs. And that's what I'm going to talk about, is these class of objects that really don't fit into these very nice classes of stars and planets that we've had uh, for thousands of years. So I'm going to break up my talk today and give you, uh, my, my goal was sort of give you more of a flavor of the astrophysics of brown dwarfs, what they are, why we actually classify them as something different, uh, and how we actually came to find them. What is the physics of actually finding these objects? And at the end, I'll give a little bit, uh, sort of a brief overlay of some of the exciting things that have been happening in the field. But I want to make sure you go home with some idea of the physics of these objects, uh, because you are physics teachers, and I think that's probably what you're interested in. Uh, but also, maybe you can take some of this back home. So, um, so the first thing, the first question I ask is, are there stars that don't fuse hydrogen? So we have to go back and actually understand why stars do fuse hydrogen. And the simple answer is that the inside of stars are extremely hot. All right? Their sun is about 15 million degrees in its core. And at those extremely high temperatures, the protons and electrons are now stripped apart from each other. They're a plasma. And those protons have enough energy to actually smack together and get close enough together to overcome the Coulomb barrier, the electrostatic repulsion, and actually fuse. And it's that energy of fusion, that energy released from those processes, that give the star uh, all the energy that we need uh, that come from its surface. All right? Now notice that you know, the core is about 15 million degrees. The surface of the sun is only about 6,000 degrees Kelvin. There's a huge difference between surface uh, in core. Now how did that difference come about? Well, it's the same physics that goes on when we look at a waterfall and we try to reproduce uh, James Joule's classic, and I should say failed experiment, to measure the difference of the temperature between the top of a waterfall and the bottom. Have, how many of you have assigned this kind of problem in your classroom? Right. How many of you know that this has actually been measured and successfully done? Yeah, I don't think it has either. <laughs> but I'm willing to try, and I'd like to try at this place because it's a beautiful waterfall. Uh, it just happens to be almost exactly 200 meters tall. And if uh, you believe that uh, the gravitational potential energy releases the waterfalls down is converted into uh, heat energy at the bottom here, you would expect to measure something like a half a degree difference. Okay? Just based on very simple physics gravitational potential energy release. Now that's 200 meters. The sun 
All right, much, much bigger. Seven times 10 to the 10 centimeters, seven times 10 to the eight meters. All right, so that is a much bigger difference in, in gravitational potential from the top to the bottom. And as Deborah mentioned earlier, what we believe in how stars form is they form from the contraction of large gas clouds. And as they contract, they're literally giving up their gravitational potential energy. And they're giving it up to heat. They're giving it up to heat and also radiation from the surface. The heat from the friction of that gas moving together and releasing that gravitational potential energy. And that's enough to heat the core up to the point where it can conduct those fusion reactions. Okay, so, so we can get some basic idea of, that, of the physics of that if we just look at sort of our basic equations for that. We have gm squared over r as our potential energy for uh, gravitational potential. Uh, and that's converted again into heat and also radiation. But notice that potential depends on the mass of whatever thing is contracting uh, divided by its effective radius. So if we have something that's more massive, we don't have to squeeze it as much, right? We're releasing just as much potential energy by squeezing it less if we have a lot more mass. And at some level, this explains why we look at stars from very, very low mass to very, very big mass, that there is this sort of size range going through there. The idea is that you don't have to shrink a big massive star as much to heat that core to start those nuclear reactions. Okay, now this is a very simplistic view, and there's other physics going on in here. But essentially, you can get something that is really big only if you're able to heat it fast enough to start those nuclear reactions in the core. If you have just very, very little mass, like these little M dwarfs down here at the bottom, they have to shrink more and more and more and keep going and keep going until they finally get to that temperature where hydrogen ignition actually occurs. Right? So, so big mass, big size, little mass, little size. And so you could say, well, let's keep going on this end. How much, how low in mass can we go and still shrink things down? Can we shrink a star down to the size of, say, a Cadillac and start fusing in the, in the core? Well, it turns out we can't, although it would be cool if we could. Uh, much better for laboratory experiments that way. Um, there's a quantum mechanical limit on how much we can actually squeeze the star together to get that, that temperature up to the point where we, we've released all that potential energy into uh, heat energy and started nuclear reactions. And that limit is, is based on the Pauli exclusion principle and essentially is that we can't squeeze, in this case, electrons close enough uh, until they actually are sort of supported. They actually can't put into the same position, same place. It's the same reason you can't put two shirts in the same place at the same time, which is always a problem with packing clothes. All right? It's that prevention of overlapping the quantum states of those electrons that sort of halts that contraction, right? And this was uh, thought about in the 1960s, again, looking at the experiment, how low of a mass of a star can we make and how small can we make it when it was realized we run into this uh, fundamental limit. So this is a plot from one of the earliest plots looking at brown dwarfs. This is a plot from Shiv Kumar, uh, who currently is actually a professor at University of Virginia. Uh, and I'll tell a little bit more about him in a little bit. Um, but this is a plot from his seminal paper in 1963 looking at how a star would collapse as you go in terms of density and temperature. So a star would start as something that's big and puffy, so very low density and very low temperature. This is the core temperature. And as it collapses, it gets more dense and it gets hotter. Again, those, that potential energy is released and heats the core. So a star would follow this trajectory up here. And hopefully it would just keep going to the point where it's able to start hydrogen fusion. And that threshold is about 3 million degrees Kelvin. I mentioned that the sun center is about 15 million degrees Kelvin, so the sun's actually able to fuse not just hydrogen, but also other elements. But the minimum that you need to start fusing hydrogen is about 3 million degrees Kelvin. Now, this other line here is sort of the barrier between when you have a gas that's sort of normal gas and a gas that's degenerate, that's supported by this degenerative pressure. You can't squeeze it down any further. And it turns out that as you go to lower and lower masses, again, you have to compress to higher and higher densities to get all the energy out. And you run into that limit. And if you run into that limit before you've actually started hydrogen fusion, the star stops contracting. And it's held in place. And you no longer have that potential energy to heat the core any further. So a star that starts like that, and in fact, that mass threshold is about 7% of the sun, a star that starts at that very low mass never gets to the point where it fuses hydrogen. It doesn't make it as a star. It's a failed star. It's a very negative connotation, but all right. Uh, but that's essentially what happens. And in fact, because it's still radiating its energy away, it's not like it can just wait longer for that potential energy to come by. It's, it's already missed, it's, it's missed the boat. Right? So it's never going to fuse hydrogen. All right, so 1963, that's when the idea came about, uh, that there would be these stars 
that don't fuse hydrogen because they're very low mass. Now that has a few consequences. Um, first of all, it has a consequence on how the star evolves over time. So this is another plot showing the effective temperature, which is essentially the surface temperature of, of the star. There's no real surface on the star, but it's essentially where we start to see most of the photons coming from the star. It's the photosphere of the star. It's the temperature at that photosphere. So when I say the sun has a temperature of 6,000 Kelvin, that's the temperature at its photosphere. All right, so this is a plot of temperature versus time uh, for some models of these very low mass stars. In fact, these are models from uh, Adam Burroughs up here. Uh, and looking at very low masses. Now you can't see the numbers, but I'll tell you that this is sort of about a tenth of a solar mass at the very top here, and then going down to lower masses. This is about 5% uh, of a solar mass. Uh, you go all the way down here to about 1% of a solar mass. And you notice a pattern here, that the things that are in the blue region uh, sort of come to a point where they equilibrate. They have exactly the same temperature over long periods of time. And that's sort of the normal evolution of a, of a star. It's producing enough energy to make up for the radiation that's releasing from its surface. It's in radiative equilibrium. So it stays at a roughly the same temperature. Now, modulo some of the, the uh, you know, James talked about the, the young faint star. So there is some change in temperature that's very small. But 30% compared to the range here is very, very small difference. Effectively, a star that has enough mass diffused hydrogen is going to stay at the same temperature for most of its lifetime. But if you don't have enough energy, you're still radiating energy away. You get cooler and cooler over time. So these are stars that not only can't fuse hydrogen, they're stars that change over time. Right? They get cooler and they get, get lower and lower luminosity. And their temperatures are actually getting very low. So the scale here, here's 500 Kelvin, 1,000 Kelvin. 500 Kelvin is something I can do in my oven at home. All right? So it's a star that's in my kitchen, just bigger. Okay? How bigger? Well, it turns out that the, that size where the brown dwarf contracts to is about a tenth of a solar radius. That's the minimum size, roughly, uh, that a star can be. All right? And then again, it's supported by degeneracy pressure. Now, this is just a, a sort of info plot. So you don't have to read all the information here. But I wanted to focus on what the conditions here in the core. Again, in order to get hot, it has to compress more and more and more to the point where it just can't compress anymore because of quantum mechanics. But it gets to pretty high densities, 10 to 1,000 grams per kilogram, or grams per uh, cubic centimeter. Uh, just for comparison, lead is about 11, right? So this is orders of magnitude potentially more dense than lead. Uh, pressures that are 10 to 11 bars, all right? Our atmosphere is one bar. Center of Jupiter is about 10 to the 5 bars. Sorry, 10 to the, yeah, 10 to the 5 bars. So this is much, much more dense than that. 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 7, thank you. Still smaller, all right? Very, very high pressures, very, very high densities. Exotic states of material can exist in here. In fact, states of material that we don't even understand because we can't do laboratory experiments to actually know what happens to hydrogen at those kind of conditions. All right? It's probably some kind of metallic state. It might be some kind of crystalline state. All right? We don't really know. We don't have laboratory measurements to tell us what happens at those extreme regimes. All right? So very bizarre uh, interiors here, um, but still, it's an object that we can consider as a star. All right? It's just a star with very, very high density and changes with time. All right. So that's the basic physics of these objects. Um, I want to talk now a little bit more about how we actually found them in the first place. So a lot of that theory uh, was worked out, again, starting in the 1960s and through the 70s, and as, uh, particularly as atmospheric models got better uh, in the 90s, 80s and 90s, and, and more recently. Uh, we've got a very good theoretical picture of what we think a brown dwarf should look like, but of course, as we heard earlier today, one always has to be careful what the theorists tell us, because uh, it might be that reality is much more different than that. Now, so there's motivation to look for brown dwarfs in that reason, because they're sort of an, an odd, exotic object. Let's see if we can actually see them. But there was another reason to look for them in the fact that they could be dark matter. All right? So uh, this is so, you know, that, you know, dark matter has been known for, you know, something like 50, 60, 70 years. Um, but, of course, we still to this day don't know what it's made out of. But around the time that you know, people were looking at brown dwarfs as another state of object, another type of star, they realized that, well, look, these things have mass, so they qualify for the matter part, uh, and they get very cold over time. That seems to qualify them for the dark part. And if you get enough of these dark, massive things in the sky, it may be that they're enough there to make up for this dark matter. And there's actually, beyond that sort of very simple argument, there's even more motivation for this. 
when we look up into the sky and we count the number of stars, particularly the stars nearest to the sun, we find that most of those stars are these red stars, these very low temperature and low mass stars. And in fact, around the 1960s and 70s, it was believed that the number of stars as a function of mass, as you go to lower and lower masses, just kept going higher and higher. And if you just drew a line, which astronomers love to do, particularly in regions where we don't know anything about, <laughs> you would find that you have exactly enough mass to make up dark matter. Okay, So a lot of motivation to look for these things. And in fact, it was around that time that the, that the term brown dwarfs, because I know I was going to get a question about this, the term brown dwarfs actually came into being. There were many suggestions for the names of brown dwarfs, all right? black dwarfs, dark stars, failed stars, substars, infrared dwarfs, we'll talk about why that's an important one. Uh, Super Jupiter is very positive. All right? We still use that when we write NASA proposals. Um, <laughs> I mentioned Shiv Kumar. Kumar was a big proponent of calling these, of course, Kumar stars. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the person who actually came up with the word brown dwarfs was uh, Jill Tarter. Does anybody, does anybody know who Jill Tarter is? Yep, so he's, she's, uh, she's the director of SETI Institute. Uh, so she moved on to greener pastures from brown dwarfs uh, looking for life. Uh, but at the time, her thesis project was actually trying to understand uh, what the properties of brown dwarfs would look like, particularly their atmospheres. And it turned out at the time, I mean, for a couple of reasons. A, it's very hard to model the atmospheres of brown dwarfs, particularly you know, back in the 1970s uh, when we don't have our supercomputers. Um, but also it, the fact that brown dwarfs change with time means that it's very hard to assign a color to this entire class of objects. We can call red dwarfs red dwarfs because they're all red. All right? That's easy. Yellow dwarfs are all Yellow, yeah, okay. White dwarfs, well, we'll talk about that later. But uh, brown dwarfs can be all kinds of colors because they change with time. So, you know, her suggestion is we don't know what color they are. Let's call them brown because brown is sort of every color. Okay, that's good. Um, turns out the actual color of brown dwarfs, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is actually purple. That would have been more exciting, but that's fine. Okay, so um, all this excitement to look for brown dwarfs, starting from the 1960s, believing that they're dark matter, motivation to look for these, the missing mass of the universe. How many discoveries are made in the 30 years after that theoretical discovery? You got it, zero, yeah. right. All right, so it took until 1995 for this object to be found, Gliese 229b. This is perhaps the only brown dwarf anyone could name off the top of their head. Um, it's the most famous. It's, Technically, people argue whether this is the first one, but this is the first one that really every astronomer agreed has to be a brown dwarf. And it was found as a companion to this much brighter star here. This star actually turns out to be one of these faint M dwarfs. So you can see how much fainter this little, little star is. Okay? Uh, this is a Hubble image, by the way. In fact, this image is also sitting up at the American Museum of Natural History. This is one of their displays, big displays, huge monster image of this, of this system because this is really an iconic photo uh, for the field of brown dwarfs, the real first discovery uh, of a thing that, that is one of these missing matter things. Um, and when you took, we took a spectrum of it, or when uh, astronomers took a spectrum, in fact, the person who took uh, one of the first spectra of this object is going to be here this week. Uh, and a very amazing thing is shown. So this is showing, the, the, again, the spectrum, the breakup of the light as a function of wavelength. So brightness on this axis and wavelength on this axis. And this turns out to be in the near infrared region. Here is the spectrum of this Gliese 229b object. Here is the spectrum of the moon Titan. Wow. All right. That's kind of amazing. And in fact, the reason there's so much structure in here is that this part of the region of the, the spectrum of the star is absorbed out by a molecule called methane. All right, we've heard of methane before. One of our uh, potential uh, or definite uh, greenhouse gases happens to be sitting in the spectrum of this brown dwarf. Okay? So phenomenally, this star, which we think is about 1,000 Kelvin, has a mass maybe about 4% of the sun, looks just like a moon. All right? so, Odd connections between uh, stars and planets here, all right? overlapping in terms of science. Now, why did it take 30 years to find this one little object? Well, uh, I'm sure as many of you uh, have been hopefully you know, successfully teaching your students, I try, I'm not so successful most of the time, uh, is explaining how uh, the spectra of things of different temperature work, the black body spectrum. All right? If we look at the black body spectrum for different temperatures, we start at 5,500 Kelvin, 3,000 Kelvin, 1,000 Kelvin. Of course, as we move to longer and longer wavelengths, more, sorry, we go to cooler and cooler temperatures, more of the light is coming out at longer and longer wavelengths. So a star like the sun, right, 5,500, 6,000 Kelvin, peaks in the yellow part of the spectrum. 
right? Peaks in the visible band. It just happens that we evolved to have eyes that look in the visible band because we're around a star that peaks in the visible band. Uh, M dwarfs are peaking more in the red region here, but when we get down to a temperature like that object, the light is all coming out at wavelengths longer than the visible in the infrared regime. And it was really because of that that we, you know, because most of the light is coming out at these longer wavelengths, we couldn't see them with our traditional photographic plates or CCD cameras that were in use uh, from the 1960s up through the 1980s. They just weren't showing their light in those wavelengths. Uh, now I like to, well, let's, let's skip this one. All right, so, so it took until really the 1980s. So you know, early technology for looking at infrared light uh, was basically little blocks of lead that you put behind a telescope, lead sulfide or lead selenide, uh, to actually detect the infrared radiation. And it's very, very coarse technology. You can imagine just putting a big block of metal behind a telescope is probably not going to give you a very accurate measure of anything. All right, but indeed, the first infrared surveys were done with little blocks of lead behind the telescope. Step up to the 1980s, as uh, better technology come out in different crystals to detect infrared light came about, we actually start having real infrared detectors, real things that look like CCDs, but are sensitive to infrared light. Okay? This is a huge jump in technology from stuff like this. And of course, today, we have cameras that have a whole bunch of these things. This is a camera uh, for the VISTA survey that's just uh, been started down in South America. Um, it has a 67 million pixel infrared camera. Okay? Little blocks of lead, 67 million pixel camera. Right? So we've made big jumps in our technology, and we required those big jumps in technology to actually detect the light uh, from these very faint objects. Now, infrared is a great regime. Uh, I, I would consider myself more of an infrared astronomer than a brown dwarf astronomer because I, I like the things that happen in the infrared. All right, you get stuff like if you look at the moon in the visible and the moon in the infrared, very different stuff going on there. All right? We see very, very bright uh, uh, craters. This is actually slightly off-shifted from each other. Uh, different features show up in that wavelengths. If we look in clusters in the infrared, in the visible, we see these dark, dark bands of clouds. These are the clouds that actually are making, are going to make those stars and brown dwarfs that we're going to look at later on. But to peer through them, if we look in the infrared much later on, right? Very long graduate thesis to look for stars that are forming here. It's only 10 million years, I mean, really. Um, Look in the infrared, we can actually see through some of those dust clouds and see those stellar nurseries. Right? The infrared light is penetrating through those clouds. Right? Very different universes are in there. All right, look at galaxies, same thing. Very different structures that we see when we compare visible to infrared light. Even when we look at people. All right? We saw an image of the, uh, the uh, um, Las Cumbres uh, group in the infrared. Uh, here are animals in the infrared. There's a great, uh, if you're ever interested in, in teaching uh, in, uh, anything about infrared science, uh, Cool Cosmos has a great set of uh, resources uh, for infrared light. Right? So the whole point is that there is a whole different universe out there when we look at different wavelengths. And indeed for brown dwarfs, the whole universe was in infrared wavelengths. We weren't seen in the optical. We needed to go to the infrared. So in the late 90s, uh, there were surveys that were commissioned uh, such as the two mass, uh, two micron all sky survey that looked at the entire sky at these near infrared wavelengths. And this is a picture of the telescope of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It used traditional CCD cameras, but it also included light at the very, very near infrared range of those cameras. So it was still picking up some of that very, very red and near infrared light. And it's these surveys that are really responsible for the large number of brown dwarfs that we have today. And just to give you an example of what it's like to look for one of these objects, uh, this is a uh, visible light image, reverse sort of inverse scale, so the stars are black and the sky is white, a little easier on the eyes, uh, of a just random patch of sky, not so random patch of the sky. And here's the uh, same image in the near infrared. Okay? And if I go back and forth here, you see more stars than visible, less stars than the near infrared. But importantly, if I go really fast, you see something coming into view right in the middle. Okay, whoops. Right, so it's a dark star. It's an object that didn't show up in those visible wavelength photographic plates or digital CCD photographic plates. It shows up in the near infrared. Right? So these are exactly the kind of objects that, that we're looking for. So again, as I said, these big surveys started finding these objects. Uh, you know, we started making news. We can see that we're already having sort of a, a bad uh, uh, publicity thing with the name, round dwarfs, poorly understood, poorly named. All right. Clearly not the best term for a new object. Um, but today, 
So this all happened in the early 2000s. Today we have at least, you know, we're starting to get to the point where we have about 1,000 of these objects known. All right. This, uh, this is a web page that uh, I maintain with a, a couple of colleagues of mine. Uh, this on a couple of classes of objects that I'll talk about in a second. But we have at least 70, 50 of, 750 of those known, where 10 years ago there were really none, all right, or a few. So this field has really exploded with lots of discoveries. Now, is there, there's another field that exploded with lots of discoveries. That is the exoplanet field. All right? And it turns out there's an interesting little connection between the discoveries of brown dwarfs and the discovery of exoplanets. In the, there was one conference in 1994 that happened in Italy where the first detection of, of that object they showed, that Gliese 229b, was announced. And another object was announced there as well. Anybody have a guess on what that object was? Yeah. 51 peg, you got it, but you have an ins- you know that. <laughs> All right. So the same conference was the first detection of an extrasolar planet was also the first detection of brown dwarf. What a great year that was for our field, right? Um, but both fields have now really exploded. And in part, again, it has to do with, with advances in technology. For the brown dwarfs, it's really been advances in near infrared detecting technology. Uh, and then for planets, as, as Deborah was talking about today, there's a lot of advances in spectroscopic methods. There are advances in, in sort of detection, sort of rapid transit detection, as Alan had talked about earlier. So there's, these are both driven by technology development. Right? The more advanced we get with our detections uh, technology, the more of the sky that we're finding, more of these interesting objects that we're finding. OK, so that's, the, uh, that's sort of how these objects were found. Now that we have literally hundreds and hundreds of these things, we are starting to learn more about their physical properties and what they're actually made out of. So that's going to be focused on the third part of the talk here. Now, uh, you know, we had, the, we had uh, uh, James had mentioned this uh, about how we actually want to find habitability in planets. It's important to look at the spectra to look for these signatures of these molecules in the atmosphere that might indicate that life is on the, on the planet. Uh, we also are very interested in the spectra of objects, uh, less so about looking for life, but more about understanding what the atmospheres of these objects look like. These are, you know, these are, are new objects, and we want to know what's actually going on in their atmospheres. Uh, and so these are the kind of spectra that we see. This is extremely complicated because this is kind of everything we know about brown dwarfs spectroscopically in one slide. So let me walk through a little bit here. It's not that much, right? Um, these are the spectra of four objects. Three of them are brown dwarfs, and one is the spectrum of the planet Jupiter. All right? Part of it is reflectance of the sun, and part of it, in fact, in the mid-infrared here, the long wavelengths, is actually intrinsic emission from the planet Jupiter. So I mentioned that Jupiter, most of the light we see uh, is reflected from the sun. In fact, if we go out to these longer wavelengths, Jupiter is itself a glowing body. It produces its own light at those long wavelengths. Okay? Uh, now, Stepping through here, you can see that each of these spectra, which is color-coded, has slightly different shapes. Right? The very top one here, uh, which, is a, which is an M-type dwarf, which has a temperature of about 3,000 Kelvin at surface, is pretty smooth. It's a pretty smooth curve. You, you might even argue it's kind of close to a black body curve, although it's not quite. There are little divots in here, right? these little features over here in the, the very optical end, uh, little lines in the top, but pretty, pretty smooth overall. When we go down in temperature to something that's uh, 1,700 Kelvin, uh, we start seeing more features, stronger features. Look at this. This is on a logarithmic scale. So to go from the bottom of this to the top of it, it's a factor of 100. All right? Turns out this is the absorption from an atom, from potassium. Not one atom, a bunch of atoms, but they're all potassium. All right? uh, really strong features. Now we go into even cooler, something that looks like that Gliese 229b object, and we see really crazy structure. Now, people I show this, they say, oh, you, this must have been really faint. You had a lot of noise, kind of a messy spectrum. You know, Sorry. But this is all real. This is all structure, real structure in the spectrum of this object. And it comes from absorption uh, from a lot of molecules in the atmosphere. And notice that this spectrum, which is a brown dwarf, again, looks a lot like a planet spectrum of Jupiter. Right? So crossing over that divide between stars and planets. Now, the, to first order, what we astronomers do with these spectra, uh, we use them as sort of fingerprints to classify these objects. Just like an ornithologist will go out and find lots of different birds and classify those groups of birds. Because that's sort of your first step as a, to, you know, to make a ruler, to measure and compare things together. You actually need to group them together so you can make those comparisons. To understand the physics of the objects, you have to sort of set your scale. So astronomers do have a ruler, and that's the spectral classification system. And as a result of these discoveries of brown dwarfs, we've actually added two new spectral types to our standard classification scheme, and potentially a third, although they haven't been found yet. So uh, these are the new types. The uh, M dwarfs are the lowest mass stars. So those actually existed before brown dwarfs were found. Uh, 
But it turns out, uh, because brown dwarfs cool over time, if you go to very, very young ages, very early on, when they've still got some of that formation energy, some of that formation heat, uh, they're actually still fairly hot and they still fall into the M dwarf classes. But these next two classes, the L dwarfs and the T dwarfs, are two new classes of stars that have been found only because we've found brown dwarfs. And they're very interesting. So you know, the L dwarfs have temperatures roughly around 1300 to 2100 Kelvin in their atmospheres. Uh, they're very molecule rich, I'll show in a second. And importantly, they have these really interesting clouds of dirt in their atmospheres. Talk about that in a second. The next class are the T dwarfs. These are the coldest known brown dwarfs. Um, this is, in fact, the class of objects that I did my, my PhD thesis research on. Uh, and they have lots of gases, including water, methane, and ammonia. We just heard about water, methane, and ammonia as important greenhouse gases in the atmosphere of Earth and potentially other planets. There's lots of that greenhouse gas in these brown dwarfs, turns out. Now, there's another class that has yet to be discovered, but of course, we get ahead of ourselves, we've already got a name for it, uh, and these are the Y dwarfs. And possibly these objects may be things that have water clouds in the atmosphere. So now we're starting to get to the things that really look like planets that, well, we think we might want to go, although a water cloud around a Jupiter mass thing is probably not a great vacation spot. But at least it's interesting because it's going to be something that looks very much, in terms of clouds, very much like the our own Earth. Now, uh, you might say, well, that's kind of an odd sequence, MLTY doesn't really follow much of any order. And of course, if you're familiar with the stellar classification system, it doesn't really follow any kind of order. <laughs> All right? Uh, there are good reasons why these letters were chosen, and I, and I don't have much time to go into it in great detail. It turns out there's only a few letters left. Right? We've used them for other things, like W's or wolf rayet stars. OK, that's out. All right? V, what a great letter, V. Can't use it because of V magnitude is very important. So, so there's only a few letters left, and that's the order they end up in. It's a great time to like, come up with great mnemonics, of course. Does anybody have a good mnemonic for when you teach the stellar class? Yeah. Yeah, I, I obviously already taught my kids the oh boy, fine girl kiss me. When I first taught yeah. them, I thought my <laughs> All right. Anybody have any other ones? So I think about this a lot. I don't know why. <laughs> All right, here's a recent one. <laughs> Obama's bailout, a federal government killer, much luck to you. Uh, here's from watching late night TV. <laughs> OK? So, so I like, I, I've been collecting these because I give, you know, whenever I teach a class on, on stars or, or, you know, the universe or astronomy or something like that, I always do this as an assignment that they have to come up with a new mnemonic. And I get some great ones, some of which I can't share in public, but uh, I get some really great ones. Okay, so, so those are the three new classes of stars. What do they actually mean physically? Well, let's go back to this plot that shows the temperature of a star over time, all right, and all these funny lines that go across here for different masses. And we define these types roughly, you know, these types are based on the spectrum of the star. And the spectrum is determined by the chemicals that are present in the star. And those chemicals are determined in, part, in large part by the temperature of the star. Also the pressure, but the temperature is a big, big uh, factor in it. And so if we put down really simply the areas and temperature where these three objects lie, notice something interesting. If I follow a line that goes through kind of the middle of this plot, it starts off at, well, let's say about 100 million years as something that looks like an M dwarf. And as I wait and wait and wait and wait till about, uh, let's say, 300, 400 million years, it starts to look like an L dwarf. And if I keep waiting only a couple billion years, not long, it might look like something like a T dwarf. And if I keep waiting like that, it's going to turn out to be something that looks like a Y dwarf. So this sequence of spectra, um, in some level, trace the evolution of one of these brown dwarfs with time. Now this has a very interesting historical precedent because the original motivation for the stellar classification scheme before we understood that it was nuclear fusion that was powering these stars was that you start out as an O star, very hot, and you just cool with time. So the G, our G dwarf, an average age star, just happens to be in the average part of its lifespan and eventually it's going to cool down to something like an M dwarf. Okay? Sounds like it makes a lot of logical sense. Of course we know now it's not a single star cooling the time, it's determined by mass. But now, thank you, is that a zero or a two? Okay, thank you. Um, so, so we know now that that's not the sequence of an evolution of a star makes, but that's the origin of our terms early type and late type. Right? Late type stars are cool stars because 
very early on, it was the late stages of revolution. But with brown dwarfs, that works out. We can actually talk about M dwarfs cooling to L dwarfs cooling to T dwarfs. Okay, so we've somehow come all the way back to the 1890s somehow, um, which is great. 1890s were pretty cool. Okay, so, so that's sort of where those spectral types fit on the evolution of a, of a brown dwarf. And it's not like I can say an L dwarf I know has a mass of this. It might be more massive and older, or it might be less massive and younger. They're mixed up. But the spectral types do trace the evolution of a particular brown dwarf. All right, so going back to the spectra, I mentioned these various chemicals in here. And here's just a laundry list of all the chemicals that are in uh, the, the gas molecules that we see uh, in the atmospheres of the objects. And sort of in a funny Venn diagram, but you can see there's lots of them here, right? We've got metal hydrides, like aluminum hydride, magnesium hydride, calcium hydride. Um, we, when we get to cooler temperatures, we get all those chemicals that form hydrides. Sorry, those are ox, sorry, hydrides. Yes, and hydrates over here, iron hydride, chromium hydride, lots of really cool chemicals in these spectra. But of course, in the T dwarfs, again, we have some of the most interesting molecules, ammonia, methane, and water. All right? Those same molecules that we're looking for uh, in these planets. And how do we know in detail that we find these here? Well, this is a spectra in the mid-infrared range, so 6 to 14 microns, way beyond what we can see with our eyes. Uh, and this is from the Spitzer Space Telescope. And again, you see this sort of funny structure in here in these spectra. Well, again, those are all due to different molecules. So we've got water coming in here. We've got methane here. And the, our most recent discovery of molecule is ammonia gas in the spectrum of a brown dwarf. Right? Ammonia gas in a star. That's pretty cool. Now, I mentioned that some objects, some of these L dwarfs, also have clouds. And it's because the reason that these molecules are in these atmospheres is because they've cooled to the point where you know, the chemical equilibrium allows their formation. If it was any hotter, they would break up into their constituent parts. But it's now cooled to the point where you can have a stable molecule. Well, you can also have cool enough temperatures to form solid materials as well. All right? So here, based on the uh, chemical equilibrium models that have been done for brown dwarfs, here are some of the kind of chemicals that we would expect in L-type dwarfs. And they're kind of interesting substances, right? Aluminum oxide, instatite, right? These things I can pick up off the ground are floating around in the atmospheres of these objects, right? Here's my favorite, molten iron. What a terrible rainstorm that would be, right? But they're there. And how do we know we're there? We can actually detect it. Again, with the Spitzer Space Telescope, these are spectra of some L dwarfs. In this little region in here, we see a very faint absorption feature. And that absorption feature, we believe, is due to silicates in the atmosphere, hard particles. They're actually present in the atmosphere. And those hard particles, just like the hard particles of water in atmosphere, probably form uh, clouds. And we actually do see evidence of that as well. If we watch a given star over a few hours, a given brown dwarf over a few hours, we notice occasionally a variation in the light. You got it? OK. <laughs> we notice a variation in the light. Uh, and that variation even changes with time. Sometimes we see a very strong variation. But a few days later, with the same source, it might be very flat. And what we believe we're seeing is that it's something like a cloudy object, like something like Jupiter, for example, that is rotating. And if it's got any features, those features are rotating in and out of view. So it's like seeing a really bright spot come in and disappear. Might explain this variation. And of course, the fact that it goes away suggests that those clouds themselves are changing over time and changing fairly rapidly. <laughs> okay, so so there are all these these features of brown dwarfs that look just like planets. They've got the same molecules, right? Methane, water, and ammonia, and they've got clouds. And so you know we're talking about looking at the meteorology of stars. Well, how are brown dwarfs more like stars? Well, there's a few things. For example, we see brown dwarfs are magnetically active. This is some radio data that was taken recently that shows that uh, the radio emissions from brown dwarfs are sometimes seen, and they're seen to be fairly regular. We don't see this kind of emission in anything but a pulsar. Right? Pulsar is a completely different object than a brown dwarf and a planet. Right? Pulsar is the extremely condensed neutron star that's formed after a very large, massive star has exploded, essentially. And yet, somehow, this little, tiny, little faint guy has very similar radio emission. And it's a signature that it has magnetic fields. And it also, in particular, it may have a very strong magnetic pole, uh, which is coming, again, in and out of view, spinning in and out of view uh, through its rotation. 
right? So that's, that's more of a stellar-like feature. Another stellar-like feature is when we look at the galactic orbits of some of these objects, right? Uh, we can now, because again, because technology is caught up, we are able to measure the positions of these objects very accurately and also their velocities, right? So velocities across the sky and velocities toward and away from us. Same Doppler method that uh, Deborah is using for her work. And by combining all those things, we can make a prediction of what the orbit of these individual objects are. So recently we've done this, and, and this is a plot of two of those orbits. This white circle is what the sun is doing around the galaxy. Right? This object is plunging from the, where we are now, because that's where we measured it, straight into the center of the galaxy and coming back out again. Looks like a little spirograph. Right? And then this green object is, again, where we are today, because that's where we're measuring it. But it probably started off something like 70,000 parsecs away from the center of the galaxy before it came to us. Right? The galaxy, visible light galaxy, is right here. This is where this object has been sitting for part of its lifetime. In fact, most of its lifetime, it's way outside the galaxy. So this is not something you'd expect from a planet, right? Not even a planet that got kicked out of from its star. This is an extremely fast-moving object. And in fact, an object that may even, not even be part of our own galaxy may have been accreted from another uh, dwarf galaxy that's in, that's, uh, that's in our immediate area. So something that you know, we look at in terms of planets, in terms of atmospheres, has a very unusual star-like property in the fact that it's a star that's come from literally outside the galaxy. Here's another thing that brown dwarfs look like stars. They have their own planetary systems. Uh, this is a recent discovery made by uh, a microlensing team uh, looking, again, looking for variations in the stellar light of a background star. I think actually this is, so the background star, let's say, imagine is way over there, right, on the other side of the wall. I like when people look over that. It's really funny. Um, all right, we're looking at that point, and we see this change in the light over time, this dramatic change in the light over time. And not only do we see a big change in light, we see this little divot at the very peak of it. Right? That big change of light is the result of a brown dwarf passing from that star. This little divot is that brown dwarf's planet. And how big is a planet? About three Earth masses. Right? Amazing. Right? Something that tiny that we're detecting based on this sort of magnification uh, in this microlensing event. Right? The primary is something like six tenths of a solar mass, so we know that it's a brown dwarf. It has the right mass for brown dwarf, and it has something that's like a planet in orbit around it. So all these hallmarks of both planets and both stars. All right? The atmospheres are very planetary-like, whereas a lot of their motions and their you know, systems that they have and their magnetic fields are very star-like. And so it's a very interesting field because we really approach it from different directions because there are features from both sides of it. So I'll just leave you with this last thought is that we now know, all right, we didn't know this 15 years ago, but we now know brown dwarfs exist in substantial numbers in the galaxy. And in fact, they exist in almost every region of the galaxy that we look. We see them in the immediate vicinity of our sun. We see them in young star clusters. As I showed that big orbit, we see them coming in from way out in the halo of the galaxy and just passing by and saying, hi, all right, nice to see you, see you later. All right, all corners of the galaxy is where we find these brown dwarfs. And they fill this gap that we've had for thousands of years, literally all of human history, we've had this gap between stars and planets, and that gap is gone. All right, these objects fill that entire gap, and they show properties of both. And in particular, from the perspective of planet-like atmospheres, they provide a very unique look at what planet atmospheres really look like. We've been talking about and today about actually detecting and looking at the atmospheres of these hot exoplanets, but it's difficult to do that because they're near these bright stars. These things are just out in the open, and we can study them as long as we want and get all kinds of information about the atmospheres of objects uh, that, that look like extrasolar planets. And I'll leave you with that, and I'll be happy to take some questions. All right, questions. It's the first hand I saw. Is there any estimate on the, the percentage of mass, uh, of the missing mass that brown dwarfs might represent? Ah, so um, excellent question. Uh, the question was what, what missing mass does brown dwarfs actually make up? In order to make up dark matter, they would have to be something like 20,000 brown dwarfs for every star in the galaxy. Now, that's a lot. That's, that's a long job, right? Um, and it turns out, you know, we haven't, obviously we haven't found every brown dwarf in the galaxy. We've only really seen the ones that are closest to the sun. But by measuring the number of those objects, 
and correcting for you know, the fact that we're probably missing some that are fainter and stuff like that. There's probably as many brown dwarfs as there are stars in the galaxy, roughly, order of magnitude. Um, and that doesn't make up for dark matter at all. I mean, it's, it's only something like 15% of the stellar mass is probably brown dwarfs. So they're definitely not dark matter. They're not even close. You mentioned magnetic fields, and yep. you also showed a slide that seemed to suggest maybe liquid metallic hydrogen. Ah, yeah, yeah. Does that imply there's convection in a layer like that? Does that tell you there's a strong temperature gradient? And does that then tell you something about energy transport and chemistry inside the star? So one thing we, we at least from the theoretical modeling we know, is that the interiors of brown dwarfs are, are probably fully convective, which is actually very interesting because... Um, one of the tests, for example, for finding a brown dwarf is looking for an element called lithium. Uh, and lithium is destroyed in the same nuclear reactions that, that change hydrogen into helium. So the fact that lithium, all the lithium in an object passes through the core at some point. If you have an object that is fusing hydrogen, we find that there's no lithium in the atmosphere. It's completely gone, totally burned away. Whereas if we do find lithium in the atmosphere, that means it's never, all that lithium has passed successfully through the core without being destroyed. So that's one of our tests of brown dwarfs is look for this lithium ion. So the first answer to your question is yes, they're fully convective, and we have plenty of evidence to show that that's the case. Now, uh, what that has to do with the generation of magnetic fields, we have no doubt that these objects have magnetic fields. Our problem is actually detecting that magnetic emission. When we look at stellar magnetic fields, we're typically looking at X-ray emission or emission in the H-alpha line or calcium hydride, calcium H and K lines, uh, these high energy lines that really come from the corona and chromospheres of these stars, the upper atmospheres, right? These objects don't seem to have coronae. They don't have these X-ray and H-alpha emissions, but they do show that radio emission. So this is, this is, this is still a bit of a mystery, is how they are showing this magnetic emission uh, without showing these other signatures that we normally see, and how to actually make the fields in the first place. Because it's a very different regime than the kind of fields that we see in the sun, for example. It's probably more like the kind of fields that Jupiter produces. I have a question. How do you define the difference between a brown dwarf and a planet? Because yeah. I've heard two definitions. One is based on a brown dwarf is big enough to burn deuterium, and the other is that brown dwarfs form by gravitational collapse and planets by core accretion. So that's, that is the million dollar question that gets people in heated debates and stuff like that. I'm looking over to Adam right now. Uh, so the, you're right, there are two definitions. One that um, I would say the one, one that is based, uh, that's more of a physical def physics definition, and that's uh, that we would divide, sort of arbitrarily divide brown dwarfs and planets based on the fact that a planet would be something that doesn't fuse anything. So it turns out, I talked about brown dwarfs don't fuse hydrogen in the cores. They can fuse other elements. They can fuse deuterium. Um, in fact, they can fuse deuterium down to very low masses, about 13 Jupiter masses, 13 or 14 Jupiter masses. And um, so you could define a planet sort of after the fact and say a planet's got to be something that doesn't fuse anything at all in its core. And 13 Jupiter masses is where that, that boundary would lie. And that's great because that means that all the planets in our solar system qualify as planets, which you kind of want. Because culturally, again, we have this definition between planets and stars that we've had with us for thousands of years. We run into trouble, though, is that we see, we frequently see, that another re re way we think about planets is whether they formed around stars is this secondary formation, secondary formation outputs of, of star formation, that they form in these disks that we talked about today. Um, and that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the final mass of the object. And today we see systems that have very massive planets around them. Planets are even very close uh, orbits around them that are more massive than 13 Jupiter masses. So are those brown dwarf star systems or are they planet star systems and how that form? We also see free floating objects that we believe are three or five Jupiter masses that fall below that, that mass criteria, but they're off by themselves. So did they get kicked out of their planetary system, or did they just form that way? So it's very difficult. So you asked what my, what, where I stand on the fence. I stand on the formation scenario, which is a very dangerous one because we don't actually see the formation. Um, I kind of know a brown dwarf when I see it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right? When I meet a brown dwarf, I know who it is. Um, but I think the complication is that we are in this realm where you know, it was very easy before we found brown dwarfs. Stars and planets were totally different things. We didn't have to worry about it. And it's very clear that we're in a regime now where there is a continuum. And that continuum may overlap in ways that we don't quite understand. 
Um, and I think it, from a physicist, that's very interesting. From someone who wants to classify things into great boxes, very challenging. Yeah. Great question, though. Oh, okay. So um, I don't really understand how very close binary star systems form um, as opposed to wide binaries. But mm -hmm. um, in any case, there is a continuum for, or, sorry, there are, for gravitationally bound systems, there are binary star systems and then there are star planet systems. But there really are not star brown dwarf systems. And maybe you were touching on that when I was thinking about my question. But why, why don't the brown dwarfs... Uh, form in those bound systems. Yeah, so, so Deborah's referring to this thing uh, that maybe some of you have heard of, of the sort of brown dwarf desert. Is that a term that, that has been heard before? All right, so what, when we look at, you know, when, when the planet hunters look for planets, it, this radial velocity technique that Deborah's been using should be able to find brown dwarfs really easy because brown dwarfs are massive, and so they should really yank that star around very hard, right? So that should be easy to find. And it turns out that there are not a lot of them in close orbits around stars. There, there are a lot of binary star systems all right, that are very closely separated. And there, we're now finding many, many star planet systems very closely separated. But there seems to be a gap in mass, where if you've got a number of planets, and then very few brown dwarfs, and then lots of stars. So the question is, why is that? And I think people still debate that. There's an argument, there's a question of whether uh, that, uh, you know, one of the reasons, one of the arguments for how you get a planet, a Jupiter mass planet, into close to the star is that there's some kind of migration process, that it might start out more at like 5 AU where Jupiter is, but for some reason it migrates in towards a star. And it may be that that migration process preferentially moves brown dwarfs right into the star, right? Throws it right into the star and incorporates it. Um, I actually don't know the status of what, that, what the theory is explaining that. That's the last sort of I understood about it. I don't know if there's a real explanation for it at this point. Binary stars, right? The close yeah. binary stars. Yeah. Well, the binary stars formed out of their own separate collapse. Uh, then, uh, you know, one thing we see about very close binary stars is they tend to be equal mass, right? So they're, they're preferentially seem to be about the same mass as opposed to a big massive star and a little mass star, right? We see this in, in young systems. We see this in old systems, particularly in high mass systems. So it may be that when you get two very close things that collapse out of the same cloud, that the mass is sort of shared between them, right? One doesn't get everything. They kind of split it evenly. Right? There's a competitive accretion process between those. So it would be hard to form a brown dwarf in that kind of scenario because you know, it would just be more mass would be falling into the brown dwarf and it would just become a star. Um, whereas if you form something like a planet that collapses out of the disk, there's not enough mass usually in the disk to actually form something as big as a brown dwarf which is another reason why I worry about brown dwarfs being in close orbits. So it may be that that's just a different formation process, and you're seeing two different formation processes play, them out, play themselves out with nothing in the middle. So right here in front? No. I, no more. In the back? Could you give me a very quick status report on the um, Adam Bergasser Endowed Chair of Physics? Did someone plant that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, actually, the recipient of the Adam Bergasser Endowed Chair of Physics is probably going to have to give that up because he's about to get tenure. It's an inside, it's an inside joke, so sorry. <laughs> Any more questions? Right there. Good. Um, I'm hoping the answer to this is you don't know because that will mean I won't, didn't miss something. But okay, okay. where in the world would a brown dwarf come extra galaxy? whizzing by to say hello? Uh, I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's a good question. I really don't know. We've just, we, only realized, we only found this object within the last year, and we're still trying to figure out where it came from. So. Uh, I'm a little fuzzy on the brown dwarf formation process. Uh -huh. um, could you just detail it a little bit uh, one more time? Sure. I, actually, I don't think I talked about it that much, so it's... it's Understandable that it would be fuzzy about it. Um, so there is, there is a pro one of the big problems in brown dwarf astrophysics today is how you actually make these things. Um, you know, we talk about, very hand wavy, that they're probably formed like stars. Because you know, we see stars, we see brown dwarfs in the same cluster. They seem to be in the same distribution on the sky. So it kind of makes sense that they probably form something like stars. It actually turns out to be very hard to make something as low mass as a brown dwarf. When, the, when that cloud of gas is collapsing down, uh, gravity is pushing in, right, collapsing things down, but there's also thermal pressure in the gas that's trying to push out. And you need to have enough mass or high enough density of gas to make that gas cloud collapse down. 
And it turns out whatever your final mass is, the lower that final mass is, the denser you need your initial cloud to be. Okay, so something like a usual molecular cloud forms a ma something like the sun, one, st one solar mass, pretty easily. But something like a brown dwarf, which is only 7% of a solar mass, it actually can't do it. It's not dense enough. So you need to get much, much denser clumps to make those things. Now the problem is if you have a dense clump, there's lots of gas around, so you make, make a brown dwarf, but then it just grabs more gas around it. Right? Kind of like we were talking about with the accretion in a binary system. Yep. Uh, well, so the deuterium is a different question. That's happening inside the core. Um, it, I have to remember what my, my reactions are. It's probably going to form lithium if it's combining with hydrogen. So, yeah. Um, so, but let me, let me follow up on the formation thing. So, so we actually have a problem on how to form brown dwarfs. And there's a lot of sort of simulations that are going on to try to actually make brown dwarfs. And it turns out it looks like what's very important is that, that things don't form from gas balls to one star. Right? It's not in isolation. There are dynamics. There are things that are interacting. There are things flying in. There's gas coming in with different angular momentum. And it's that dynamic process that may allow a very dense pocket of gas to form, make a brown dwarf, and then stop accreting. And that's still an open question how, to, how that works. There's many, many theories actually on how to, how to make brown dwarfs. Yes? Uh, is there any data to support that the uh, migrating brown dwarfs merge together and then can start burning hydrogen because they accumulate enough mass. Ah, so if you have two brown dwarfs that kind of combine? Two. Yeah, combine and it becomes a regular star. Is there any evidence for that? So there's no, there's really no direct evidence of that happening. Um, I, I would suspect that that's a very rare occurrence. We very, I, don't, I can't even, I'm, think off the top of my head of any evidence of two stars combining to, to make another one star or, or that being caught in the process. And I may be wrong. I don't know if anyone else has, has heard of that. But um, so, so, so we don't have any evidence of that happening. However, that is certainly a possibility. And there was this great paper by uh, Fred Adams back in 2002 where he looked at what the universe would look like, what our galaxy would look like, you know, 100 billion years from now when all of the stars that we see today have burned out, have exceeded their, their main sequence lifetimes. And what you would end up with are black holes, neutron stars, white dwarfs, and brown dwarfs. Because they don't die. Because they're not burning anything, right? And, and one of his arguments in that paper was that, you know, after gazillions and gazillions of years, uh, the only way to make a star, because all the gases are dissipated, is through the collision of brown dwarfs. And you could do that frequently enough where you'd have something like 50 stars in the galaxy at any one time. And they're just formed from brown dwarf collisions. So, so, but that's very theoretical. And that's not something we've seen. Yeah. All right. So I think that's the end of the question section. We have just about run out of time. So let's thank Adam again. Thank you. And next up on the